اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللہین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین وخاطب النبیم سیدنا و نبینا و شفینا ابلقاسم محمد سم صلاۃ وسلام علی علیہ طیبین طاہرین مظلومین المعصومین سیما علی غالب کل غالب علی ابن ابی طالب ولا سید نساء اہل جن فاطمت الزہرا ولا بنیت سید زین و ام کلثم ولا رقیہ و رباب و لیلہ و ام فرو و فضت و جمی شہدا و العسرا و لانت اللہ علیہ عدمعیم اما بعد فقط قال اللہ تعالیٰ و تبارک فی کتاب المبین و ہو ازدق القائلین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لا تظلمون و لا تظلمون سامعین بردر سسٹرس آف اسلام آن دس نائنتھ نائنتھ ڈے آف محرم ٹو پے آور رسپیکٹ ایون آور گریچیٹیوڈ ٹو دا شہدا آف کربلا ٹو دا مارٹس آف کربلا لیٹ اس اسپینڈ اے فیو منٹس اے لٹل ٹائم آف پریشس ٹائم دیٹ وی ہیو ان ریمبرنگ دیم remembrance of the dead, of those who have passed away, of those who have contributed through their sacrifices of, in their lives, are actually the real treasures of this world that we can all share. Allah SWT says, don't. Don't think it's even worthy enough to think of joining, clasping the hands of your, the dictators, the tyrants, the oppressors. Don't. Think of those who need your helping hand. Think of those who need your love and intention and care. It is those who are oppressed, those who have been bullied, those who have been terrorized in their lives. The battle of Karbala is not between two princes. The battle of Karbala was not fought for the seats of power, uh, but it was fought for one thing, for the right and wrong, for between good and and evil between tyranny and the the oppressed one between zulm and between zulm and zalim and mazloom if we look at it we see on the field of karbala those who came left their home and the serenity and the tranquility of medina knew very well They, have, they are leaving Medina with one-way ticket and the ticket that is they will never return home. Most probably death is the thing that is waiting for them. Brothers and sisters, death is waiting for our efforts. When we say, inna lillahi wa inna hirajun, to Allah we will return, we will. To talk to us about the inevitability of death and our fear of death and th- talk about those who did not fear death. In fact, death feared them. I have, like other days today, again, I have an honorable guest, a great scholar, a great researcher, a person who has spent a lot of time reading 
the history of Islam, the scripture of Islam, a brother, Christian brother, who has done a lot of valuable work towards bringing the people of different religions together in his effort, tireless, tireless effort that he has put through in community harming and interfaith relationship is our brother, I would say, a young brother in Chris Hewitt. Chris, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Death is inevitable, but we fear death. But today we are sitting, actually, trying to remember death, the passing away of martyrs whom Allah say they never die. Why do we fear death? I think that we fear death because we, we have a natural fear of the unknown. MashaAllah. We do not know what awaits us and therefore we want to hang on to what we have. Because we have a, a natural fear of the judgment that follows death because we lack faith in the promises of God that are contained in the Quran and in the teaching of the Prophet. The, the permanence of this life is an illusion. It is a natural consequence. If you are born, you will die. There is no escape. The Quran tells us every soul shall taste of death. Full stop. That is the inevitable. I remember once watching a group of Buddhist monks. There were six of them in total, and they were making a traditional Buddhist picture. It was huge. It was about two meters square, and it was to be made with grains of colored rice. Minute in every detail. They would use the tube of a biro or a straw to blow precise grains into the right place. They worked in shifts day and night. It took them one week, seven days to complete this picture. And it was a work of wonder when it was finished. And when it was all completed and everybody had looked at it, there was then a ceremony in which they took the board on which it had been made and they tipped all the rice off the corner into a bucket. Oh dear. And this was the reminder to us that this life is not permanent. Everything that we try to hang on to will go from us. So if we try to hang on to this life, you will lose it. To lose it in a good course is to gain the eternal reward of the martyr. So this permanence of life is an illusion. This is the first thing. The second thing is that we, we rightly fear the judgment. Mm. We are all aware we look back into our own lives. There are things that I have done that I shouldn't have done. There are things that I should have done that I failed to do and I will be held to account. Now again, the teaching of the Quran, the teaching of the Prophet gives us guidance here. It tells us, fill your life with good deeds. Marshall. Fill your life with good acts. This way you wipe out the effect of your bad act. Now, when the Jewish community celebrate New Year, they, they have a, a little ritual. Different foods are eaten. Jews are very keen on eating food at different festivals. And for New Year, one of the things that they eat is a pomegranate. Uh, what's a pomegranate in Urdu? Anar. Aha. Okay, so it's known. You know that in a pomegranate, you have thousands and thousands of seeds. Yes. And they say, May your good deeds be as many as the seeds of a pomegranate. 
so that you may fill the whole of the new year with good deeds. So this is the recipe for those who fear the judgment. Commit yourself to good acts. In this way, you wipe out the effects of the, the sins of an earlier time of one's life. And then a third thing is that people want to pretend it will never happen. Do you know you can talk to people who are 80, 90 years of age and they will still talk in such a way as though they're going to live for another hundred years. The, the teaching of the great spiritual masters is always to say that you are to live, yes, as though there may be a hundred years ahead of you and therefore you have to live with the consequences, but you should also live as though today were your last so that we must always be aware of this impermanence. And again, there's a, there's a good story here told of Jesus in the Christian scriptures when he talks about a rich man who is a farmer and he has had a plentiful harvest and he builds huge barns so that there will be plenty of place to put his harvest in the future. And then he sits back and says, my barns are full, my life is secure, now I can have a good time. And then Jesus goes on to say, you fool, this very night is the night of your death. This very night you will be, you will be required to give an account of your life. So we should live always in this tension between a hundred years and right now. And so living always, doing what is right, filling our life with good deeds, in this way we overcome the natural fear of death. In nutshell, our brother Chris, from the Buddhist, Jewish, and modern day life, he has portrayed to us that, look, we, you, we, you and I, and most of us, fear death because we don't know what, is the, what the unknown is. But if we read the texts of Allah, our great book, the Quran, and listen to the sayings of the Prophet and the Imam, then we are certain what awaits us. It is our duty to understand their words after knowing and understanding, then only the belief, the strength of the inevitable will, will gain the momentum and the strength and inertia we need in our belief. A beautiful example of pomegranate, which we call in our language Anna, is beautiful. And he said, there are so many multiples of seeds, may the life be long as the seeds. But our Imam, Mala, also spoke about the pomegranate. He said to one of the Khalifa, he was sitting with him, that you know, in this pomegranate, there are thousands of seeds, and it is a, like a honeycomb structure. Each seed is destined in one of those pouches. Nobody knows which is the first seed. Nobody knows which is the last seed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam says, has placed one seed in there, which is the fruit of heaven. Right? And he says, if possible, don't share. Share the pomegranate, one each, but if, uh, if you're eating, eat one whole one wholesome because in that is the seed of heaven, eyes of long life. The Khalifa, 
who knows and knows that he is never sure of what is after that, right? He wants to impress upon the Imam that he has eaten the, the one of the seeds which could be from heaven. So he eats it. He, he thinks he has finished it. And he's sitting there, his beard there, and, and the Imam moves forward, takes a seed which is hanging in his beard, puts it in his mouth. To show, never be sure on this life, in this life that you have eaten the final seed of life, which may be a gift from heaven. To the last breath, our duty is to carry on in the orders and the forms of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to perform, us to perform. Life is inevitable. Death is inevitable. Like other doctors, I too as a doctor have written a death certificate of a newly born baby, a little child, a young man, a brave young man in his prime of his life. An old person. We don't know where our time will be, but we know it will come. And when we know it will come, then we know the clock is ticking. There's the seconds, the minutes, the seconds that have gone by are never to come back. But if we know that the last deed we did we did will be acceptable to Allah, is the deed we come. The fear of death is because we, from our actions, are not sure that it, these deeds are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even our prophets in their lives showed us that, really, I don't want to go to God now. Give me some more time. And it is said that Hazrat Musa al-Islam was passing by and he saw a grave digger, right? He said, somebody digging grave. He thought to himself, it would be a kind act for me to give this man a helping hand to in digging the grave. It would be a kind gesture. He said, young man, can I help you in digging this grave? And he said, yes, please. So Musa steps in, comes down, and starts digging the grave. When they've dug a bit, Musa says, hold on. Can I ask you, for whom are you digging this grave? What is his height and stature? When he looks at Musa, he says, uh, Oh visitor, his height and weight and stature is the same as yours. He says, Okay, let me lie down. Then he lies down. And when he lies down, then he realizes, one day he too will be in this confined space. And the angel of God asked, Musa, are you ready for your death? Then Musa has learned his lesson and tells the angel, when God's wish is there, I am ready for death. When we look on the fields of Karbala, there are children on the night before Ashura who will not breathe thereafter, whose mother's laps will be empty, the cradle will be empty, their cries for milk and water will there be no more. We know next day the mothers know that it is inevitable their young man, prime of life, whose marriages the parents would wish will not come back from the battlefield. We know that it is inevitable that death will come. They even know this much, that even after death, what will be the conditions under, under the enemy's hands, but they are not afraid. May I ask you, from your thoughts and from the knowledge and the readings that you have done, why are the warriors of Karbala so much at ease and comfort that each of them are asking each other, 
No, I should go first. You go after me. And they are not giving second thought of what will f happen or b befall when on, they're on the battlefield. One of the particular strengths and characteristics of Islam is that the, the relationship between God and the individual believer is direct. There are no priests, there are no sacraments, there's nobody to stand in between God and the believer. And therefore, the believer is the one who is totally responsible for his or her own faith. And to be a martyr in this way, to accept the inevitability of one's death, is a question of one's faith. Not to be stuck in that doubt about what will happen hereafter, but rather to know that one is going ultimately obediently to God, and that God wills only good, so that whatever comes hereafter will be good. We can see it in the example of Abraham and Ishmael, both of them being put to the test. And we're told not only does Abraham ask Ishmael, what do you think about this command from God? And he, of course, replies, if it be the will of God, you will find in me an obedient servant. But the two of them go forward together to the place of sacrifice. They prostrate there before God and lay their whole lives before God in total obedience. Abraham stands to perform the deed and Ishmael remains in prostration. He is not bound, he's not tied, nobody is forcing him of his own total surrender to the divine will. He remains. Now we can see the quality of his faith. Yes. That he knows and is convinced in the very depths of his being, I go to God, I am performing the act which is in accordance with the divine will. That is the quality of the faith of the men of Karbala who are prepared to go to their death with their eyes wide open, knowing full well what is happening, knowing that death is not the end, that death is the doorway. Mashallah. The doorway to the life hereafter, the doorway to the life of paradise, and that through this doorway, they will go in obedience to the divine command. So it is a question of our personal faith in believing the word of God and in trusting in that relationship. And that's why, in a sense, however long we live, yes. we are every day preparing for our death yes. by strengthening that faith so that we may be confident in the encounter with God on the last day. If we look at the words that you have said, we, each day is a day of preparation. And it is him that we will find the everlasting peace. And it is his judgment that will count not ours, not our parents, not our priests or mullahs, but it is his. And it is he who, being all just, will reward us in the most kind of way, kindness of way. If that is true, then if we look at the history, you gave wonderful example of Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Ismail And we realize that both of them said, whatever is the wish of Allah, it is acceptable to me. We know also that each of us 
try to teach our children be good. Saying Chris is one thing, being and doing another. We look at in the present day and time, in the reign of Saddam Hussein, the f family of Ayatollah Khui and many other families, it's only few, not too long ago, that they were given choices to follow his dict dictates or to follow Allah's given principle. And they, he chose to follow Allah's given principle. It is said that before his eyes, he had a big drain, of, uh, drain full of ice, full of acid. And he takes one of the female members of his family and he just puts them in that ball of what you call acid. And within seconds, the whole body is gone. And there are many other, it isn't just with him, there are many such cruel acts that has been performed. And with the reason people say, I don't know what, I'm ha what is heaven and hell, I must make, enjoy this life to the best and do what I think is right. In the history of Islam, there's a story of Shaddad. Shaddad is a man who becomes very rich and powerful. And so arrogant he is, he says to the Prophet, I will create my own heaven. And he asks the Prophet, what does heaven look like? He says, there will be trees of gold and palaces made of, you know, precious stones. He says, I'll do that. He builds everything. And one day he decides to go to the heaven he has created. He goes, gets on to his horse. Shaddas gets onto his horse and he, he is on his horse about to enter the doorway of his heaven. The, the front leg of his horse is in the air about to enter the heaven. Then Allah says to the farishta, to the angel, take his ruh, take his, take his soul out of him. And the farishta say, the angel say, let us at least let him enter the foot. He says, no, it is I who decide who enters the kingdom of heaven, right, and who doesn't. So that is to say, in our lives, if we seek the pleasure of Allah, the kingdom of heaven will be far easier than Shaddad tried to enter his very own kingdom of heaven. If we take that, then we learn lesson that thousands of soldiers are there. And it is said, one by one, each of them go to fight. And it is a combat between one against thousand. Yet brave souls, whether it is Anu Muhammad or old man like Habib ibn Mazai, they do not flinch. Yet, Today, if I say to somebody, let's go to Karbala for Zarat, no, 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 no. Uh, the streets of Baghdad are too dangerous, right? Yet they know the very people who lie there, whom we do the Zarat, even their companions did not flinch in front of not one, thousands of soldiers. What gives them that strength? and a surety that people like them, those who don't want to go, or even myself, don't have that strength. And the second question to that is, how do we build up that strength, showing the great panoramic picture of sacrifice on the field of Karbala? I think we build up that strength, first of all, by observing the world around us. We observe that flowers bloom, flourish, wither and die. 
we observe the, the shortness of the life of some of the insects and other animals. We have a, a tradition from medieval Europe that people would have a skull on their desk in their study. And this was called momento mori. It means to remember death. So that you would have before your mind all the time the knowledge that um, I only have a short time on this earth. And this builds a certain relationship. We know that the Jewish women of Europe used to wear their wedding ring on this finger, the right index finger, because that was the one with which one points, that was the one that was before their eyes most of the time. A constant reminder to us of our position. We see Sikh men and women going around with a, a bangle on their arm. Every act that I do is accountable to God. So in this way, with these ideas, we are building up this notion of accountability so that our death lies always before us. And I worked one time with a, a, a mathematician to try to draw out the balance in which God will weigh us on the day of judgment. Because we are told that on this day, our deeds will be weighed, but our good deeds weigh ten times heavier than our bad deeds. And once one sees this balance and sees the, the, the power of good deeds in the balance of God, it gives us a great sense of, of hope, of trusting ourselves into the hands of God, releasing ourselves, just as a, a parachute jumper has to have the confidence to release herself from the aeroplane and trust that the parachute is going to do its job so that our lives become this act of trust so that we trust that God is, as it were, waiting to receive us into the next world. It's only in these ways that we can build this assurance that we see on the field of Karbala. Indeed. The examples you gave are the vivid examples why a person kept a skull on his desk. To the earth, from the earth we came and to the earth we go. We will go to and Hazrat Imam Musa Qasim was in prison and he was in the cellar below in prison. And those who came to visit used to say, in front of the prayer mat, he had dug a space for a size of a grave. And they asked him, why have you got the sign of a grave? or the digging of a grave, he says, to remind me in each prayer, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His grace, His benevolent, benevolence and His love to help me to prepare myself to this dust I shall go. And every day when we say our prayers, we, those who believe in the martyrdom of Hazrat Imam Hussain al-Islam and the Shuhada, we too actually use our index finger to point towards Karbala. And we say them salam, we point our finger to them that, O oh, Shuhada of Karbala, we, I point my finger towards you because when we point, we point in only one direction. We are not using our hand in the Y. And we say that you have tasted martyrdom, 
you have tasted the death o shuhada of karbala and we pointed with our index finger that is i hope that allah gives me courage to follow your path and be paid to the death and in availability of death as you did so bravely on the field of karbala and this is the way we prepare ourselves when we see a little footballer kid right he wants to play like beckham and he says i wish i could be like beckham and the father gives him buys him a little ball and he puts it on the ground and he says dad i would like to be a great player like beckham well he says if you do you watch how he plays then he sits down and watches beckham play and when he sees the great man play and he score goals he shouts and says yes he is his role model and allah says if you want to prepare yourself just like a kid wants to prepare himself to be a world class player allah said you too for us humble people have a role model and prepare yourself to achieve the inevitable that they did and the field of karbala is a good example for little girls little boys and girls children young and old to find a, a perfect role model that will show them how to kick a ball that curves to reach the goal as beckham the great footballer did samain my audience my brothers and sisters we are all trying to achieve to get to the mountain top if we look at the foothills we will remain at the foothills if we look at the mountain top we will get somewhere allah subhanahu wa taala says lift your spirit up lift your eyes up lift your belief and faith up we can only do when we say that hillary and tenzing how they climbed the mount everest then we will know if they can climb i too can climb in the same way we too allah says look at the mall role model right if we say imam hussain al islam is masumin his too far no there are others as well but allah says follow your imam because he is your leader he will show you how to climb that mountain he will show you how to conquer that great peak and it is those more role models who who conquered who conquered the way we conquer everest they conquered death they mastered they had the strength to conquer death it is from their lives it is from their examples it is from their sacrifices it is in their love for allah subhanahu wa taala and the law allah allah demand that we will have courage to face the love as this it was it was a bed of roses for all of us that is the field of karbala that is death death is inevitable death is something we should all remember death is something we shall all have to face have to face is easy to say for me right sitting beautifully in this comfortable chair death was not easy to face when in karbala they had been without food and water for 3 days in the sultry heat of karbala how can we imagine those mothers those fathers those children faced with death what does your study say how did they face it i think that they faced it not only with a knowledge that they were living in obedience to the will of god they were going forward to god but they were putting down a marker Marshall. they were giving a message they were setting an example 
that would ring throughout all the ages. Here we are 1400 years later, we are remembering, we are reliving, we are teasing out the meaning of that event. And in this way, they had a, a glimpse, I think, that they were engaged in a monumental act. Mashallah. An act that would not only be important in their own time, but that would ring down through the centuries, that would be important not only within the family of Islam, but within the family of humankind, so that they were giving an example, living according to the message so that we would have a role model and we could follow. And the living witness of one who sacrifices everything that they have, their very life, and who does it with courage and with full confidence and trust, is a role model that can inspire us and can comfort us. So I go as the martyrs of Karbala went. This can be an inspiration for us right down to the present time. So when we say every day is Karbala, every day is Ashura, every place is Karbala, then we too have to be prepared like them? We too have to be prepared for the inevitability of death. It may not be that God calls you or me to martyrdom, but we may be certain that God will call us to death. And therefore, every day is the encounter with the inevitability of death. Every place is the place of the death of someone. In the short time that we've been speaking this afternoon, people have been dying. Hundreds, thousands of them have been dying during this time. This is the inevitability of life. And so we remember that right here, right now, that invitation is being given to somebody. And we should all prepare for it by filling our imaginations with the teaching, with the witness of the example of the deaths at Kabbalah. And that is why we appreciate and honor the deaths, the shohada of Karbala, the martyrs of Karbala. We honor them, we respect them, we love them for their example. Because by the willing sacrifice of their lives, they give countless thousands, millions, we can say, the, the strength to go on and to live in the same kind of way. So honor, respect, and love for the martyrs. We are come towards the end of our program. Honor, respect, and love the martyrs of Karbala. The martyrdom is something achieved when we give in the name of Allah something which treasure the most. And it is giving that utmost, giving that maximum, the, the giving the inevitable is called martyrdom. We all die. But if we die, with the words of Allah on our tongue, with his love and belief in him and his prophet, then actually we die all, even without being on the battlefield, we die the life of a shahada. As I said, it's easy to give. Let me tell you, the most difficult thing, the most difficult act is for a mother to give her little baby, six months old, to send it to the battlefield, knowing 
that baby will never return. And that is what happened in the field of Karbala. Little Ali Asghar, a babe, six months old or so, is crying in the cr cradle. Thirsty, mother has no milk in her breast. There is no water to quench the baby's thirst. Imam Hussain al-Islam comes and Imam Hussain al-Islam comes to the baby, says something in his ears. The baby leaps into his arms. It is a hot day, very hot day. The sun is full <coughs> of heat above. To protect the baby from the sun, Imam Hussain al-Islam takes his cloak, his abba, and covers the little baby. Takes him to a little height and holds it in his arm. A little Ali Asghar. The enemies think he is trying to going to make a speech. Perhaps covered under the cloak is the Quran, the book of Allah. He will recite and quote the ayats and verses. And the Imam lifts the lifts the Abba from the face of little baby Ali Asghar and holds him in the arm in front of the enemies to see. So that history will cannot say that he did not let everybody see. He walks from one end to the other, showing each of them what he has in his hand, the little thirsty baby. And he says to them, your fight is with me. Your enmity is with me. Your demands are on me, not on this baby. O oh, the soldiers who, who stand before me, you have children of your own. This baby is thirsty and hungry for the last three days. And he says to Ali Asghar, O oh, Ali Asghar, show them your past tongue. And when Ali Asghar protrudes his past dry, cracked tongue, even the soldiers in the enemy's camp begin to cry. But the, the Mal'oon, the tyrants of the army there, stand and say, what are you watching? Do the qita of the kalam of Imam Hussain. Make the voice of Imam Hussain silent. I, O Hurmala, O Hurmala, use the three prong arrow to silence the voice of the thirst, hunger, and justice. Uh, that very dry tongue of Ali Asghar is saying. Hurmala puts his arrow on and points towards the little baby. Hurmula is a master with his bow and arrow. And three times he aims and he, three times he gives up. And Umar Asad asks, what is it Hurmula that is stopping you from shooting the arrow? He says, you know, I can see before my eyes our Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad وسلم, and his family, all standing, pointing towards me as if saying, Oh, Hurmala, what are you doing to this little child? He said, Hurmala, you know the rewards that awaits you. The lust of this world, the hunger for the the glittering gold of this earth makes Hurmula shoot that arrow. That arrow goes into the air. The angels watch, the thin watch, the sky watches. 
it goes. It's a three-pronged, very powerful big arrow. It goes the other way and pierces the arm of Sayyidu Shuhada. And a fountain of blood erupts from the little baby's neck, Ali Azwar. Imam Hussain al-Islam takes the flowing blood in his hand and he said to the sky, this is the sacrifice I have. Oh, sky, accept it. And the voice from the sky says, Oh, Hussain, if you throw the, this blood towards the sky, I promise you never a drop of rain shall fall on this earth. Imam Hussain al-Islam, in his symbolic gesture, says to the earth, I drop, oh earth, accept my son's blood. And the sky, earth says, oh Hussain, one drop of blood that falls on the ground, never a grain shall grow from this earth. You know what? A father who has just had his own son, six months baby, shot by this arrow to death, takes the word and puts it on his face and his beard to say, Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajihun. And he carries this baby towards the tent. And it is said that while other lasha, other bodies, he carried them inside the tent. Imam Hussain doesn't have the courage to take this little baby to her mother. It is said before the tent, he walked several times front, seven times back. Then he decided, no, how can I give this baby back to her mother? With his sword, he digs a little grave and buries Ali, Ali Aswar in there. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi. Rajun.